comes to your mind when you think about Christmas? That was the assignment that I gave to some members of our preaching team a few weeks ago. Now, each person was asked to unpack the main impact that decades of experiencing Christmas as a follower of Jesus had left upon them. You've been following Jesus for many years, I said. You've been pondering Christmas for all of those years. So what have you learned? What have you concluded? If you had to summarize what Christmas means to you, what would you say? Well, today it's my turn. So to prepare for this moment, I literally sat down at my desk with a blank piece of paper in front of me and I thought to myself, okay, Darren, think, think about Christmas. What kind of thoughts come to your mind? What's your your biggest takeaway, Darren, when you think about the Christmas story? Well, I've got to tell you, what bubbled up from within me, what rose up to the surface surprised me. As I thought about Christmas, two seemingly random, two entirely disconnected events in my life came together in the most fascinating way. As I thought about Christmas, two completely unrelated moments in my life, unrelated to each other and unrelated to Christmas, intersected in my mind. And the more I thought about them, the more I realized how powerfully they communicated what in my mind is the ultimate meaning of Christmas. Now, the first story that popped into my mind took place over 30 years ago. Now, what happened was I was in Bible college and and, uh, my car broke down. So my parents actually bought me another car, a used car. Very kind of them. They paid for it, bought it for me, gave it to me. And I drove that car uh, throughout Bible college and into the first year of, of my marriage. Well, then through a long story that I won't get into, I took over the payments of another vehicle. And so suddenly I had this other vehicle, the first one that my parents bought for me that I didn't need anymore. And uh, so my mom decided that she wanted to get her license at a later stage in life. And my dad said, hey, Darren, you have that other car. Do you want us to take that other car off your hands? And so I said, sure. And my dad says, well, how do you want to do this? And I said, well, how be you just give me whatever fair market value is for it? My dad said, okay, we'll do that. And I looked up what fair market value was and my dad gave me a check for that amount of money. And I took the check and I went on and I didn't think about it for a couple of years. And then a couple of years later, I thought, hold on, time out. My parents bought that car twice, twice. They paid for that car twice and they never said a word. It cost them a lot of money and I was oblivious to it all. Bizarre. Well, Then another random event popped into my brain. Years ago, when I was back in Ontario, I was part of the Niagara Regional uh, Police Service. And uh, as I was part of that service as a a chaplain and an auxiliary inspector, I was in on a raid for a drug house. So I sat in the room in the police department as we planned this raid on this drug house with a SWAT team. And we all had our assigned roles. And then we got into the back of the SWAT truck with the canine and all the guys in their rifles. And we're driving to this drug house in the center of the city where I was uh, pastoring at that time and working. And I was thinking to myself, as the adrenaline is coursing through my veins, this is exciting. We are heading to a raid with a SWAT team and canine. We're going to bust into that drug house and shock those people. Like, this was exciting. And, and I thought to myself, the people in that drug house right now have no idea what's coming. They have no idea what's heading their way. That thought came to my mind as I sat and thought about Christmas. So there you have it. Two seemingly random, unconnected vignettes from my life. Me being oblivious to the feelings of my parents when it came to them paying twice for the same vehicle, and me having inside information as I participated in a surprise raid on a drug house. Why did those stories pop into my mind? And what did those stories have to do with each other? And what did those stories have to do with Christmas? The more I thought about it, the more it all came together for me. That first Christmas event was an event that brought great joy to humanity, but it came at a massive cost to Jesus, a cost that we were oblivious to. That first Christmas was the ultimate secret mission. It was the unfolding of the greatest raid in human history, a raid that was secretly planned and thoroughly hidden from everyone. Essentially, Christmas is filled with secrecy with things taking place behind the scenes. 
And all of this secrecy, all of this hiddenness, all of this planning ultimately had one goal, one purpose in mind. And that one goal, that one purpose, the one ultimate meaning of Christmas is a bit shocking when you hear it. In fact, if I told you right now what I think the ultimate meaning of Christmas is, you would probably think that I was crazy. So let me do my best to work my way towards it. When I think of Christmas today, I recognize that Christmas is shrouded in the unknown. First of all, there's the unknown nature of the Messiah. Have you ever watched a mystery movie for the second or third time? I mean, it's fascinating, but it's not nearly as exciting, is it? But it's fascinating because the second or third time through, you start to see things and you connect dots that you didn't see and you didn't connect the first time. There was no way you could have seen them. They were too subtle. They were hidden. They could only be seen with hindsight. Well, this identical dynamic takes place when it comes to us and the Messiah. Now, the word translated Messiah was fairly common in the Old Testament. It occurs over three dozen times. It simply means anointed. The Greek word for Messiah is Christ. So the term means someone set apart with divine authority for a special role. Now, lots of people were anointed in the Old Testament, especially prophets and kings. Of all the references to the Messiah in the Old Testament, only a handful referred to someone coming in the future to rescue the people of Israel. And there's not a single Old Testament verse that describes a dying and rising Messiah. Not one. The idea of a dying and rising Messiah was nowhere on the Jewish radar. Now, never mind rising, just the idea of a dying Messiah wasn't on the radar. Now, when we think of Messiah, we think of someone who comes to die on our behalf. When we think of a Messiah, we think of someone who comes to save us from our sins. But that was not at all what a first century Jewish person would be thinking. A first century Jewish person, when they thought Messiah, would think of someone coming to take the throne of King David and to be a political ruler and to rise up and raise up the nation of Israel and destroy their enemies and conquer their enemies and rule from Jerusalem. That's what a first century Jewish person would think when they thought Messiah. So on that first Christmas, when Joseph and Mary and the shepherds heard that the Messiah was being born in Bethlehem, they were not thinking of someone who would someday die on their behalf. No, they were thinking of someone who would someday conquer on their behalf. The Messiah doesn't die at the hands of his enemies. The Messiah defeats his enemies. That's why when I think of Christmas, I think of an event that was shrouded in the unknown. The nature of the Messiah was unknown to them. They couldn't see it in their Old Testament scriptures at the time. It was there, but it was hidden. Now, looking back, we can see the trail of breadcrumbs. Looking back, we can now see, for example, what Isaiah 53 is talking about. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed." Now, looking back, we can see clearly how this describes Jesus and what he did on our behalf. But that's all from looking back. At the time, it was all unknown. Nowhere in Isaiah 53 is the word Messiah ever used. Jewish scholars didn't think that Isaiah was talking about the Messiah. Looking back, you and I can clearly see now uh, that it was. And as well, looking back, you and I can clearly see now why while he was on the cross, Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he quoted a psalm there, Psalm 22. But here's the thing. The psalms were not numbered at that time. So by quoting that verse, which is the very first verse in the psalm, Jesus was directing them all to read what is now known as Psalm 22. So hanging on that cross, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was saying to everyone around him, if you want to know what's happening right now, read that psalm and you'll find out. 
And what did they read when they, uh, what did they find, I should say, when they read Psalm 22? Well, they began to see what had previously been hidden. They found clues to what had been unknown for centuries. They discovered that Psalm 22 was about the Messiah. They turned to Psalm 22 and they read the following. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Think of it. That was written centuries before Jesus ever walked the earth. Looking back, we can clearly see now how this describes Jesus on the cross. But that's from looking back. At the time, it was all unknown. But there was more that was shrouded at the first Christmas. Not only was the idea of a dying and rising Messiah nowhere on the Jewish radar, but the idea of the Messiah being God in flesh was nowhere on the Jewish radar. On that very first Christmas, when the shepherds rejoiced with the angels and the wise men eventually showed up after following the star, none of them had any idea that they were looking into the eyes of God who had taken on human form, human flesh. The idea that the Messiah was God was never taught in their schools. It was nowhere on the Jewish radar. Now, looking back, we can see the breadcrumbs that were laid out. Looking back, we can see the hints in the words of the psalmist, for example, when he wrote about the king of Israel. The psalmist said, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, looking back, we can now see that that was hyperbole for Israel's earthly king, but it was reality for Israel's coming Messiah. But who could have seen that? I mean, who could have ever imagined that? Yeah, Christmas is shrouded in the unknown. They were oblivious on that first Christmas, just like I was oblivious when my parents bought me that car for the second time. What I thought was taking place and what my parents knew was taking place were two very different things. But there's more. Because when it comes to the very first Christmas, not only were they dealing with the unknown nature of the Messiah, they were also dealing with the unknown mission of the Messiah. And this is where my drug raid comes in. And this is where things get really fascinating for me. Because this is an area that took me decades to fully appreciate. This is a truth that I've really only truly been able to grasp in the last few months. You see, for the longest time, there were strands of truth hanging out there that I had never been able to tie together. Now, I've long been aware of what the average Jewish man or woman did and did not know regarding Jesus back then. That I understood. However, there was an area that was always murky for me. Now, this is gonna sound strange, but for years I wondered, what did the demons know and what did the demons not know when it came to Jesus? Did the demons know who Jesus was? Did the demons know what Jesus came to do? Well, if they did know who he was, why did they respond the way they did? Why would the demonic realm incite people to crucify Jesus if the demons knew that the crucifixion would save people from their sins? Didn't make sense. So what did the demons know and what did they not know? Well, Jesus' interactions with the demonic realm gives us part of the answer. Mark records that a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out. And so he shouted to Jesus, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In the eighth chapter of his gospel, Matthew records another instance of demonic interaction. What do you want with us, son of God? The demons shouted. Now look closely what the demons called Jesus, the Holy One of God, the Son of God. 
No one else at that time was using those titles for Jesus. The demons clearly knew who Jesus was. They clearly knew that Jesus was God in flesh. So Matthew and Mark tell us what the demons did know, but the Apostle Paul tells us what the demons did not know. Paul wrote, he says this, We declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Paul is saying that the religious and political authorities and the demonic powers that incited them had no idea what God was planning. God's true intentions were shrouded. His ultimate plans were hidden. He had kept them hidden for centuries. Now, they knew that Jesus was God in flesh, walking the earth, clothed in human form, but they did not know what God in flesh had hidden up his sleeve. The demonic question was one thing, but there was another question that bothered me. What did the angels know? And what did the angels not know regarding Jesus? Were the angels in on the salvation secret? Or had God kept the plan hidden from them as well? Well, I got thinking, if the demons knew that Jesus was God in flesh, it's obvious that the angels knew that as well. That being said, the apostle Peter tells us that angels did have some questions of their own. Peter wrote this. He said, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with great care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. And then look what he said. Even angels look long to look into these things. Peter's saying that God's prophets and even God's angels did not know the full scope of what God was planning. They had some clues, but not all of the clues were adding up for them. They had some clues, but they could not see where all these clues were pointing. Now, for the longest time, I had these questions just hanging out there like shiny tinsel on a tree, like unconnected dots on a page. But recently, these dots finally connected for me. And that connection helped me to see the Christmas story in a whole new light. At the very first Christmas, humanity was oblivious as to who Jesus truly was. Now the angels and the demons, they knew a bit more than humanity, but their knowledge was limited as well. The angels and the demons knew who Jesus was and what Jesus had come to do Jesus said many times that he'd come to usher in God's kingdom. So they, they knew who he was, what he'd come to do, but they had no idea as to how Jesus would actually do it. They knew who he was, they knew what he came to do, but they had no idea as to how he would actually do it. Like our raid on that drug house, Jesus' mission was kept very secret. The theologians had no clue. The scholars had no clue. The politicians had no clue. The demons had no clue. The angels had no clue. The devil himself had no clue. Only God knew, and he kept it all shrouded and hidden until it was finished. So why did God insist upon such a high level of secrecy? That secrecy was God's way of ensuring that the mission would be successful. Remember what Paul said, none of the rulers of this age understood it. If they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the devil had known what Jesus was up to, the devil would not have done what the devil did. If the devil had known that Jesus dying would destroy death and save humanity from their sin, he would not have crucified Jesus. Just like me with my parents, all of creation was oblivious to what was truly going on. Just like the dealers in that drug house, all of creation had no idea what was about to take place. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing Christmas in a whole new way? In spite of all the angelic announcements and the celestial signs and the stars in the heavens, Christmas is actually all about the hidden. Christmas is actually all about the unknown the Messiah's unknown nature, the Messiah's unknown mission. There was so much going on that was hidden from everyone. It was all a secret. It was all a mystery. 
Only God himself knew the entire plan. It's what comes to my mind when I think about Christmas. Now, which brings me to what I said at the beginning of today's teaching. I said, if you remember, I told you that if I said to you right now what I think the ultimate meaning of Christmas is, you're going to think I'm crazy. Well, we've come to that moment, so here we go. We've learned today that Christmas is shrouded with the unknown, that Christmas is filled with secrecy, with things taking place behind the scenes. And all of that secrecy, all of that hiddenness, all of that planning had one goal, one purpose. And that one goal, that one purpose stands as the ultimate meaning of Christmas. And here it is. It's today's big idea. The meaning of Christmas is you. You. You are the reason for the season. You are the reason for all of the secrecy. You are the reason why God took on human flesh in the form of a baby 2,000 years ago. You are the reason why that baby grew into a man and died on a cross. You are the reason for the most incredible mission ever imagined. You are the reason why that mission was formulated before time began. You are the reason why that mission was kept hidden from every other being ever created. You. You are the reason for Christmas. Jesus said, for God, speaking of his Father, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Let me help you to personalize what Jesus was saying in that verse. Certainly, the world applies to everyone, absolutely. But don't overlook this truth. Instead of the world, put a blank in that spot of the verse. For God so loved blank and put your name in that blank for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish if you believe in him you'll not perish but have everlasting life you are the reason for Christmas it was all driven by God's love for you so the next time you hear the question so what's the reason for the season you can answer with the full authority of scripture and with a heart full of gratitude you can say I'm the reason. I am. I'm the reason for the season. God did all this planning, all this preparing for me. Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus rose again for me. That's what comes to my mind when I think about Christmas. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you loved me, that you loved the world so much that you sent your son Jesus to pay our moral debt, to die on our behalf. The, the eternal principle is that the wages that sin pays is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you that you paid my moral debt and you purchased the gift of eternal life for me, and not just for me, but for everyone who would call upon your name. Thank you for that. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your love. You did it for me. And so I accept your gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Come into my life. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Give me a new life and a new start from this moment on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me right now, on the screen you should see a number. Text that number and someone will respond to you. Now we're not tricking you. You're not joining Broadway Church. You're not going to be put on a mailing list. But Text that number and someone will help you take the next step in your journey. God bless you and may you have a Merry Christmas. God bless.